Right, yeah. I think we're on, Mark. Right, hello, everybody. Um, welcome to the uh, first in a series of, uh, of webinars that we're going to be hosting at NCAS um, over the coming weeks. Uh, my name is Alan. I'm uh, MD at NCAS. And then I've got to, to my side as well, uh, that fine looking gentleman, uh, Mark. He's also one of the directors uh, here at NCAS. Mark, say hello. How are we doing? Uh, very well, thank you. How are you? It's a sunny day. Not too bad. Not too bad. Thanks, man. Not too bad. Um, okay, right, let's crack on. So we've wanted to do um, a webinar at NCAS for some time, actually. Um, with uh, recent events as they are, this has really just given us the impetus to get get these started. So uh, we did aim to sort of launch last week. Um, but to be honest, the last few weeks have just been uh, so crazy busy that we just, uh, yeah, we just weren't able to squeeze it in. So anyway, I'm really pleased that uh, we're here today um, and that we can get this ball rolling. So please do bear in mind that this is our, this is our first one. So uh, there may be a few uh, teething issues. So uh, yeah, please forgive us that. Uh, this is actually only my second time in charge of the software app that we're using as well. So um, who knows what might happen. Uh, throughout the course of the series, um, we're going to be looking at the many challenges that our industry faces. Uh, also, ways in which those challenges really importantly can be overcome as well. Um, we're looking to provide information and advice um, and insight and inspiration and some success stories. Um, and so in line with that, we're going to be featuring some special guests, including some members and professionals and experts, um, maybe even an MP or two. Um, we shall see. Uh, so anyway, today is just an intro to the series, really. Um, we're going to be looking at how the coronavirus has affected, obviously, the hospitality industry over the last six to eight weeks, um, but also how our industry has responded um, and also really where possible adapted as well, because I think that is really, really key. Um, and so, yeah, what we've uh, what we've managed to achieve together as an industry or as a sector, um, which, again, I think is really, really important as well. So uh, as today is the first one, uh, we won't be taking any questions live today. I can see those sort of comments coming through on the right hand side. Um, nice to have you all with us. Um, as I said, yeah, we won't be any, taking any questions live today. But if you do have a specific question um, that you want answered or a topic that you wish to see tackled, then please, please, please email opinion at ncas.org.uk. Um, and we're going to do our absolute best to get uh, all those questions or all those issues um, talked, discussed, and hopefully answered in future uh, editions or episodes. Uh, so I'm just going to rattle through a quick recap because I think it's important to do a quick recap um, on what's happened so far with COVID-19 in regarding particularly our sector. Um, well, look, there's no beating around the bush. Um, the impact on most businesses um, out there has been uh, in hospitality in hospitality has been absolutely devastating uh, mobile caterers in the event sector street food um, you know uh, sorry uh, roadside caterers pitch traders function caterers pubs restaurants coffee shops bars you know they've all been affected um, you name it really when when coronavirus began to rear its its ugly ugly head um, in this country, things change very, very quickly indeed. Um, one of the first things we began to see uh, around about the beginning of March was events being cancelled uh, by the organisers themselves. Um, and this was actually before the actual ban on, on public or mass gatherings. Um, organisers were rightly starting to get a little bit twitchy about the chances of their events taking place, uh, particularly you know, in the coming months, April, May and June. Um, and as we know, the public uh, concern rightly grew as well. So with that, ticket sales for those events um, and all events really began to diminish, well, pretty rapidly, uh, which obviously led to caterers who had pay paid pitch fees for those events that were uh, then cancelled, facing a real battle to try and then get refunds. Um, it also left many other traders who had pay uh, pitch fees for events later in the year. Uh, wondering if they should inquire about refunds or what they should be doing. Um, some even raising sort of chargebacks or credit card refunds. And I know that some traders have had sex, uh, success with that. Um, and it left even more traders wondering whether or not to pay the invoices or the pitch fees that were due to pay um, for, those, uh, for those events that were taking place sort of from July onwards, right up and through, uh, right through to October. Um, obviously, our advice, as it has been for the last uh, six weeks, to be quite honest, um, is to simply not to pay any pitch fees right now. 
um, as yeah, this, the chances of those so-called events taking place even up to September. And to be honest, quite right now, you know, beyond that, um, they just seem absolutely slim at best. Um, yeah, we just don't know what's going to happen or even as well, um, without being too negative, whether or not there's going to be a public appetite for mass gatherings or, you know, how that's going to sort of evolve, really. Um, we just don't know. So obviously, you know, there's a huge amount of uncertainty and confusion and concern from obviously all traders and, and of course, the public alike. Uh, so on the 20th of March, we essentially entered lockdown where all pubs and bars and restaurants, etc., were closed overnight. Um, which basically led to a virtual total loss of income for pretty much all hospitality businesses and traders, just literally just like that. Sorry, that was a finger clip. There we go. Uh, but so then the waiting began on what support or financial measures the government would introduce to support businesses um, for our sector, particularly independent catering businesses. That's what we had our eyes sort of uh, focused on. Um, and in regards to that, in particularly the self-employed, which I know is is many of you out there, uh, those measures were announced over the course of about a two week period, give or take. Um, what we now know is that many of our members have been able to access those measures or that support, um, either as a limited company through taking advantage of the employee retention scheme um, or through the self-employment measures. Uh, but also, really importantly, many still find themselves to have slipped the net. Um, they're not eligible for the new self-employment measures. Um, and also many of our members are not applicable for the grants uh, that apply to biz, uh, business rate pay businesses as well. Um, we will be having a dedicated episode, um, if I can call it that, on the financial measures in the very near future. Um, we're going to have an accountant on to talk to, to talk us through what it all means for our members. Uh, and hopefully maybe by then we'll, we should have more clarity on, on when we can expect some of these measures or, you know, actually expe uh, uh, expect some of these uh, yeah, these financial measures actually land as well. Uh, Mark, would you say that pretty much sums it up? Uh, oh, muted. Yeah. And I think that um, a lot of people have been really badly affected. Uh, a lot of people have missed out on uh, the various different measures. I think that initially we were all reassured that hospitality would um, get support, which it, it did. Uh, but somehow we've fallen out of being classed as hospitality. So... What we're trying to do now is to rectify that, um, uh, amongst other things, really. But um, yeah, I, th I think it, it for us, we started to get get calls about pitch fees. Um, that that was pretty scary at the time because obviously the whole events industry runs off pitch fees. So uh, pitch fees, sponsorship, bar money, that, that's what sets up festivals. So when they when customers were rightly querying whether they should be paying them, uh, we didn't know. The answer because we didn't know what's going to happen uh, and then all of a sudden that all kind of collapsed um overnight and then yeah within a week um street food was pretty much street food was actually doing okay for a, a week or so uh reporting good uh turnouts at events but the corporate side of street food and the function side of it was falling off a cliff while that was happening uh, i was chatting to a, an event organizer a street food event organizer and he was just getting text messages going cancel 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 and he's like this I've lost 100 grand in the last 10 minutes, you know. So it's, it's been brutal for a lot of people and it's been very scary and not knowing what to do. And, you know, it's almost that people haven't had the chance to worry about the virus because they're still too worried about whether, whether they can put food on the table and, and what that's going to mean for them. Or if they are okay for the time being, what will that mean in the future for them? Will there be an industry to go back to? So it's been a very frightening time for a lot of people. Yeah. Um, and to to miss out on that government support was pretty frightening and, and scary and devastating for a lot of people. It's not something that we've given up on. It's something that we're very much pushing for still. And you know, with the support of the NCAS membership, who've been fantastic throughout this, we've actually had real wins, I think, on, on that front. But we, I guess we'll speak about that in a moment. But yeah, yeah. it's, it's a, a, a tough month, definitely. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, the, yeah, it's just the last three or four weeks have just been utterly crazy for everybody in our sector. Um, so just in terms of what you were just saying, um, yeah, I want to sort of get on to that in terms of what we've been doing at NCAS because you've been sort of really key in that. Um, so, yeah, in terms of what NCAS has been doing to support you guys out there um, just so far, and I'm not going to dwell on this too quickly. I'll try and rattle through because 
uh, as well as providing, of course, all the content um, and handing all the a, a lot of inquiries either via phone or email. Um, and to be honest, our inquiries have gone up something like 250% over the first two weeks. Um, it has quietened down a little bit now with, um, you know, the sort of uh, the lack of new measures uh, introduced by government. Um, but as well as all that, we've been writing uh, letters to government departments, um, writing statements and reactions to, uh, to government announcements. Uh, gosh, gosh, I don't, don't even know how many surveys we've sent out now. Uh, but sending surveys, yeah, which are really, really important actually to get the data that we need um, to present to the relevant bodies and, and, and government bodies as well. Uh, we've been creating petitions um, and generally just representing your views, guys, as best we can to pretty much anybody we can. Um, it has been a bit of a contacts game. It's felt like climbing a bit of a ladder at times. Um, in terms of the polit political spectrum, um, and Mark's done a really good job of that. Um, and then also more recently, we've been uh, in line with that. We've been attending meetings or phone calls with MPs, which has sort of just started to take place in the last couple of weeks. And that is really so that we can put your case across. Um, we'll put the case across, sorry, for those members that have slipped the net um, of, the of the measures that have been introduced by government. Uh, over the last couple of weeks. We've also um, been focusing on the issue of street trading licensing as well um, and where everybody stands on that because that's such, still, like, still such a grey area. Um, and Mark's going to tell us more about that really shortly. Um, and on top of all that, of course, we've been releasing resource packs to our members. So the latest of which um, hopefully should be available today on the NCAS website. That is a COVID trading pack. Um, so that's all the risk assessments and the statements and the declarations, guys, um, that you want that you need if you're trading during this period. Um, so that's going to be available on the website, hopefully today. Um, and the other thing, the key other thing, the other key thing, sorry, that we've been working really hard on is to try and find or access opportunities um, for our members to trade as well. Um, for those that are still want to trade or still able to trade, of course. Uh, so that means we've been approaching hospitals and trusts directly. Um, to offer the support of feeding their key workers at this essential time, because I really do still believe uh, that mobile catering is one of the safest ways to feed key workers right now um, for many, many reasons, of which we'll definitely come across, uh, uh, sort of talk in more detail in future episodes. Um, and also talking to the government directly, the Department of Health, about the prospect of mobile caterers um, and how they can be a real key benefit uh, in feeding the country right now. Uh, so what I just want to say at this point is just a massive, massive thank you to all of you guys out there. Um, massive thank you at this point, because literally all of you have played a part in what we've been able to sort of uh, put to government and, and, and hopefully the, the impact or the difference that that has made. Um, literally, without your uh, input and without you filling out those surveys, then we don't have what we need to take to government to try and instill or enforce change. Um, literally our, our shoutings at government and it is shoutings uh, are nothing without the data so uh, what, what we've learned pretty quickly is that one we need to present the problem to government uh, two you then have to provide that data to back up that problem or prove it uh, and three then provide solutions where possible as well so that's exactly what we've been doing but it's all thank uh, thanks to you guys so uh, right, Mark, I've been talking far too much here, so let's hear more from you. Um, obviously, you've been really, really heavily involved with the lobbying side of things recently. So who have you, who have you, who is it that you've been speaking to exactly and, and how has that gone so far? Well, I mean, when, it, when the, the, the problem first hit, you know, me and you had a chat and we thought, you know, let's, let's look at this, let's risk assess it. You know, as good old NCAS, for the risk assessment. Um, but let's you know, look at where, where the... Um, you know, where the risks are and what you know, potential solutions there could be. And it looked pretty bleak and that was back in January when we had that discussion. So we realised that if it hit, there would be a problem. Then we realised that when it did hit, it's like, well, you know, money's great, money will help people, but we won't necessarily keep them in business. It might get them through the next few months. It might uh, overcome some immediate fears, but it won't necessarily save the business. And I think that's one thing we're starting to realise, even for the people that did get the the twenty five or the ten thousand pound grants, is it's not necessarily going to be enough to to resolve their problems. There's many other issues. I think that's going to cause a major problem. Rent is going to cause a major problem. When we got dropped out of the hospitality side of things, obviously the mobile catering side of things, which is a major part of NCAS, um, a lot of those guys don't have lockups or prep kitchens. If they did. 
Uh, it turned out a load of them weren't registered as hospitality businesses at that premises, and so people have got rateable property, but it doesn't apply. Uh, we've even had you know, there's lots of people that are subletting, so they're not so they're paying business rates, but they're not going to the government; they're going to the landlord, who's then paying them, so then they don't get the payout. So we realised pretty early on that money wasn't going to be the the cause, the solution to this problem. Working with the solution to this problem, and as more and more restaurants were shutting down. The fact that we were mobile meant that you know we could extend what was the ECS service that we do for Western Power and actually potentially provide emergency care across the country. So we took a kind of we contacted Bayes, the Department of Business, Energy, and Industrial Strategy, uh, who managed the Prime Authority Scheme, which NCAS is a part of, all of the NCAS members are part of, and said, "What do we do? You know, we've always played the game, we've always done our bit, we've always tried to help government where we can to support our industry. We need help." And to be fair, they've been really, really helpful. And I think that part of the problem, and it's, it's very hard to say to someone that's sat there looking at no money in a bank account or the various other problems that our customers are going to have at the moment, to say to them, you know, hold tight, things will change, we're going to get there. It might be slower than we'd planned to, but we're going to get there. But, yeah, we're talking to, through Bayes, they put us in contact with um, the Minister uh, for Small Businesses, uh, Paul Scully, who's been really helpful, really understanding. We've been chatting to him on a weekly basis now. Uh, everyone within Bayes has been really handy, to be fair, really uh, committed and, and dedicated to trying to get NCAS members out working again because they understand the problem. These yeah. things take time, though. and uh, So they've put us in contact with the local government association because in order for us to go out and trade, in order for us to get potentially 6,000 street trading licences, then the local councils can't cope with that kind of work at the moment. Uh, the street trading doesn't really suit uh, what the plan that we have to actually get out there and help people uh, because it's set pitches and takes time and there's all kinds of issues with it. So, um, yeah, we, we it's, it's been a two or three pronged attack, really. It's been how do we get grants? How do we get included in the grants? So that's been talking to the Treasury and to, and to Bayes. How do we get this self-employed issue resolved because loads of perfectly honest decent people have missed out um through these self-employed measures measures missing them and how do we get people out working again and and can we get people working in a safe way uh, as takeaways or or as delivery businesses so yeah it was can we can we help and i think i think that's one of the main things that's helped us get our point across to government so far is that we've not gone cap in hand we've gone saying look we really want to help we want to keep working we're grafters this is what we do. We work in difficult situations, knocking out great food at high volume, making people happy anywhere, any place, any time. And I think the country kind of needs that at the moment, especially with so many big uh, chain restaurants, etc., shutting down. You know, people are struggling to access food. People are struggling to access food in the supermarkets. No one can get on these unless they're already on an Ocado type delivery thing. People are struggling to get on them. You know, there's all kinds of issues that need resolving out there. And also there's the, yeah, the, the people that um, you know are living on the edge anyway, or who are of a high risk in terms of health. A lot of people are going to need feeding, and you know we're basically we've got the summer off. We, you know, this is we work all summer, we work our nuts off, and then we have a slightly quieter winter, and that's not going to be the case this year. So we very you know, straight away we said, look, hire us. We you know get get mobile caterers working. We'll sell what food you want us to sell. We'll sell cheap food, we'll sell uh, healthy food, but give us a chance to hold on to our, our, our businesses and our careers. And um, to be fair, they've been really receptive. It, it just takes time for these things to happen. And I think that a couple of things have happened that are worth bearing in mind. Uh, one, I think that Boris being ill last week would have created a bit of, or last couple of weeks, would have created a bit of a power vacuum within government in that no one could have made a, a major decision maybe without his say-so. Um and also, every conversation I've had with civil servants and, and uh, people within the government, what they're saying is, you know, when, when you bring in a piece of legislation, it usually takes two years. And you think through everything that could happen, and then you bring it out, and then there's still things that go wrong, and you have to tweak them and, and, and get, get the legislation right. With what's happened here, because it's uncharted territory, it's unprecedented, and it's just landed so quickly and in such a devastating way, that they dropped headlines for policies and then worked out how to make the policies work. And that's why people have fallen through the gaps. It's not because um, they don't like us or they don't think about my catering. It's just they were 
looking at quick solutions to to solve big problems and they put those in place and some of them missed the target for some people so we're, we're that everything is still to play for in that sense i think that the gov we have to take the government at face value when they say that no um um no viable business should go under and hopefully they will stick with us and deliver that because i think most most of our guys their businesses are viable but we're in a very difficult situation um you know it's potentially april next year before a lot of our guys could earn again on the usual cycle so yeah we, we definitely do need support and help but we're, we want to work as well yeah absolutely i just think for, for, i mean I, yeah but i just keep keep thinking obviously mobile caterers are professional this is what they, they adapt you know they're out there selling in the middle of nowhere in fields for weddings festivals you name it and this is what these guys do they just get out there and they set up you know with a, a an hour's notice and can can get out food quickly and do it safely and do it i think a lot safer than a lot of these you know a, a potentially a lot of other businesses that are sort of providing that service right now so um for us i know at ncas it's just been a real um, I guess it has been a bit frustrating that we haven't really been called upon, uh, you know, sort of on mass. Um, what do you think are the chances that that might happen, Mark? I know that you're in, uh, we're in talks uh, with the um, with the NHS in particular, the Department of Health. Um, do you think that maybe there will be a chance that um, that the government, from a top level point, a top down point of view, will actually sort of look at mobile catering and say, do you know what, this is a real, real solution to providing uh, to providing food for key or essential workers. As uh, safely as we can now. Yeah, definitely. And I think that from an early stage, um, me, yourself, Bob, uh, we all um, realised that the way to do this would be top down. We couldn't go to every single hospital, every single charity in the country and say, do you need help? We um, still tried. <laughs> yeah, well, we did that anyway. But we, <laughs> we also went to, um, you know, we went to government and said, look, you know, we've got an off the shelf solution here for you. Um, why don't you take us up on it? And I think, so we are now um, going to go onto NHS procurement lists. Um, I've just had another email from I don't, another government department I didn't even know existed um, about what we could potentially offer in terms of getting our members out there trading. We're in contact with local authorities. So yeah, I think there's, there's definitely going to be um, opportunities to get out there and trade. And also, you know, if we can get those opportunities to trade, then there's no reason why people can't actually also go out there and just do normal delivery takeaway type stuff uh, to the public mm -hmm. also need feeding but yeah. you know we've got, fortunately we've got bob um and we've got jenny uh, jenny morris who's just like food safety whiz she knows everything and she's wonderful uh, as is bob so you know they they've helped develop these um these tools that will enable our guys to go out there and trade you know, absolutely safely so um, my one of my big fears is obviously an NCAS member getting ill and because yeah that'd be devastating Spe speaking of which, Bob Bob's been sort of waiting uh, on the sidelines yeah. for us patiently. Let's let's bring him in because uh, can we bring him in? This is where I'm going to go wrong. Here we go. Hey, there we go. Bob, we've got you on mute now. Can we unmute you? Bob, you there? He's still on mute. There we go. There we go. Bob, Come can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Can you hear me? Hey, welcome, welcome, big bad Bob. So this is Bob. Anyone that doesn't know, Bob is the chairman at NCAS. Uh, so Bob sort of started NCAS, um, gosh, nearly 20 years ago now, Dad. Uh, he's also uh, my dad, by the way. I th think more like 30-something, but yeah. 30, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm very old. <laughs> Well, it originally started off with the Mobile and Outside Caterers Association, and it was um, it was turned into NCAS around about sort of 18 to 20 years ago. I joined about sort of 14 or 15 years ago. So it was me and dad just sort of in a garage for, for quite some time. And then it was that man in the middle that joined yeah, us, garage. actually. So. Yeah, the, the garage we're in now, which, yeah, is actually a home cinema now, not, not an office <laughs> <cinema. laughs> They put a window uh, so in when I joined. <laughs> okay so bob we were just talking yeah. about mark was just making the point about um uh, about opportunities for trade for caterers and then he started talking about safety so that's why i thought it'd be a really good point to bring you in at uh, because i know that one of the uh, one of the things that you've been doing is working closely with jenny morris who's um the food safety expert at ncas <laughs> um on the covid compliancy uh documents um in particular the risk assessments um, and the statements and the declarations that any traders that are out there, they're, they're trading now should be using. Can you just tell us a bit more about that? 
Yeah, I mean, it's one thing being able to trade. It's another thing being able to trade safely. And it's a further element to be able to trade safely and uh, tick all the right boxes. So that's what Jenny and I have been working on for the last uh, two to three weeks now, I guess. Uh, and hopefully is what's comprising that pack that you said is about to go out today. So uh, and risk assessment is just the short end of it, really, or the front end. That really tells you what you need to do. And then, you know, it's actually going out and doing it. Um, so there are obviously still all the government measures in place wherever possible, social distancing, etc. cetera. Um, there is some variation on that, but you need to keep to the social distancing. That's the main thing. Also, particularly fam uh, people where the family is trading as a whole um, is really, really useful, i.e. where they're living together and actually working together as well because they're not really coming into contact with the outside world anywhere near as much. So it's a very, very useful um, family unit that could trade very safely and keep easily within the law. I don't know why my head keeps tilting over slightly. I don't know what it is. I think I must have Tourette's or something. <laughs> <laughs> maybe maybe, it's, maybe, maybe no, it's just the, old age. Oh, yeah, maybe. Yeah, maybe I'm just losing the plot. Actually, it's because there's a certain little... That little person here that wants to come and say hello to everybody. Oh, hello, hello this, Paddy. This is, this is Paddy. He's my resident food safety expert. He's my food. <laughs> he, he tastes my food every day to make sure it's uh, it's not poisoned or everything. Uh, and, then, <laughs> and then when we take him around the park in the morning to social distance, of course, we know whether it's safe or not. Okay, cheers, Bob. The, um, I was just going to say, so, but and this is a question to both of you, really. Maybe, Mark, if we start off with you first, um, I'm just a bit wary of time. This, this has sort of uh, gone way quicker than I thought it would. Um, so what advice would you be giving to anybody that is, um, and we will be touching upon this, sorry, um, in, in future episodes in more detail, but for now, what advice would you be giving to anybody that is uh, contemplating whether or not they should be trading right now uh, to Mark first? Good question. Um, I think if, if you've... If you need to trade, then you're going to trade. Um, I think that you know the, the the best advice really, I guess, would be to not trade because it's the safest thing to do. But most of us aren't in that situation, and people do need feeding, and you know, we need to go and do what we do. I think that within the next few days, we're going to get some real movement in terms of the advice given to local authorities on street trading. So that should make it a lot clearer for local authorities and for traders to to know how and where they can operate. I think that. You've just got to stay super safe and make sure that, you know, the social distancing side of things, looking at, you know, it has to be card payments, you know, people picking up food on, on, on appointment rather than having them queue down the street like we're seeing outside some of these takeaways. You know, the, the more that you can do to the risk of your customers, then the more likely you are to succeed to, you know, to to get the support of the local authorities and, and the enforcement officers, things like that. Because we've had a few... Uh, members be visited by policemen that aren't clear on whether they should be open and telling them to shut down and things like that. So I think that in the next few days we want to go quite, once we've got the go-aheads from the local government association that they have made, provided clearer uh, data or clearer information for people, then we want to get out there and tell all of those people that might uh, want to trade but also those might be enforcing or or supporting their work, what, what, it, what, what it looks like and how we expect uh, NCAS members would be operating. So, yeah, I think that there should be an opportunity in the next couple of days for people to, to be op operating as a takeaway or as a delivery if they aren't already. Yeah, I think that's been one of the issues, hasn't it? It's just literally there's been, at times, it's felt like such a lack of clarity um, on some really, really big, important issues. And it's not just with the guards of our sector and, and in particular the traders. It's also with the guards of the public as to, you know, how safe is delivery of food and, and this, that and the other. And I, you know, one of the things that I really just that we've been calling for has just been more clear guidance or more clear sort of, uh, I guess, clarity from the government in terms of, you know, what is safe and what you can and what you can't be doing, etc. It, it has been a challenge sort of, um, for, you know, for all the guys watching out there and all, all the members to, to, to really know, you know, what's what in, amongst all of this. There's so much noise that, you know, it's just it's very difficult, isn't it? Well, yeah, the, the, the problem is there that the science still isn't there. You know, the science isn't there as to whether this this virus carries on packaging, it carries on plastic. We know it does, but for how long? So, you know, these are the kind of worries. And there's just there's no answers yet. There just isn't. There isn't the science to support the arguments. 
so it's but, uh, um, it's, it's very difficult the answer the answer is you've just got to be as safe as you possibly can you've got to take every yeah. possible precaution um and you know if one thing's come out of this then everybody needs to get you know card payments sorted if they haven't already there are systems available you can get onto very quickly i think we've actually got one as well but um contactless is what it's all about you know you do not want to be handling card machines um between you and customers that is an absolute disaster recipe for disaster yeah and all, all of that is covered in in all of the uh, the covid compliancy uh, documents etc that pack that we were uh, <coughs> excuse me that we're releasing uh, hopefully today on the ncas website as well um, mark I, have you got anything you want to add to that yeah I, I think that part of the problem and it's been a problem with a lot of the issues that our members have faced is that a lot of these decisions are, are happening at local authority level so you know the street trading rules pretty much all come down to the local government miscellaneous provisions act that basically says each local authority can determine how they manage their own street trading at the same time pretty much everyone that works in street trading at local authorities has now been repositioned into another critical role within the council so and we're having a similar sort of situation with people when they're chasing up uh, these grants the, the hospitality grants that they actually can't find anyone to speak to and they can't get a clear answer and because there's three four hundred local authorities there are three four hundred different answers so that's why we've had to go to local government associations department of business and say look can we get something that can be sort of cascaded down that is clear for people to use because there's no point in us saying to our customers go out and trade and then they get shut down the next day because you know a local enforcement officer's around and said that they're not happy with it so it's 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 been really tricky because it's it's about getting everyone in government is really struggling to deal with this situation because it's unprecedented and it's massive and everything has changed overnight and everyone is making decisions that they have to live with and it's yeah it's about you know getting getting the right people at the right time to get the decisions that we need to to get the clarity that we need to trade but the way we see it is that if restaurants can be allowed to repurpose themselves as takeaways then mobile caterers should be able to as well. The only problem is that we don't have anywhere uh, a spot of land that we can legally trade from without a license. So it's about how do we clarify that or get those um, uh, requirements removed in a temporary way so that people can trade. Uh, and and we haven't sort of covered it at all today, but you know, the people who are actually working on pitches at the moment, who's supporting them because you know they're, they're just dropped off a cliff and. You know they're still being asked to pay pitch fees and they can't get hold of anyone at the council and so the, the real problem is the fact that it's been that the responsibility lies on a local level so getting the the, the information through to them and, and the, the messaging through and also getting the you know getting the local government association can't just tell every local authority what to do, yeah. ask them or to advise them so yeah. We'll never get, I don't think that we'll get something that says every NCAS member can go out and trade tomorrow and it's assumed they've got a street trading license. Although that's that was the initial ask because I don't think that they are in a position to give that to us. But what they can do is advise local authorities on how best to deal with these situations. And so it might be a little bit murkier than we'd hoped. We'd, we'd hope for a nice, clean um, go out and trade, but I think that we'll get what we need even if we didn't get you know, specifically what we wanted so yeah it's it's, it's been it's been tough at times. yeah yeah so mark it, it, like just in light in line with that what um for the members um <clears throat> customer, yeah for our members watching if they have actually gone out and started to to try to offer Operate in some form of capacity um, and they have had challenges or obstruction from local authorities um, do you are you wanting them to be uh, do you want them to notify us of those in yeah, particular please instances do. Please do, yeah so we're, we're, we're looking at everything on a case-by-case -case basis uh, we're passing on uh, case studies essentially to the local government association and they've even uh, a couple of lovely ladies there who've uh, actually stepped in on a couple of cases for us and contacted the local authorities and chatted it through with them and the problems been resolved so if you are having problems trading absolutely let us know put it all in an email um or put it all in an email <laughs> bakes and brick giving me a call it's been what <laughs> um <laughs> uh, i've got what i was talking about now um yeah 
that's how you feel about about the so it's about it's about the uh people reporting instances that they're having on an individual local authority level to us so that we can then take that information and take it to the lga and say here are the problems what can we do about this yeah put it put it in an email and then we'll call you back um okay you know seriously put in a bullet point email tell us what the story is what's happened um and then when we we'll read through it we'll call you back we'll know what the deal is and we'll ask you some pertinent questions about it and hopefully um you know, get you a good result but the main thing is that you have to be trading safely so if you know if if we phone up the local government association we phone up a local authority and say you know joe blogs has been stopped from trading that they turn around and go well you know he's having a party outside his trailer mm. it's game over for us and, and probably that trader so um yeah they've you, we've got to be following the rules absolutely to the to the to the letter and as long as we do that then we should get the flexibility uh from the local authorities that we hope for and and there has been some instances of real i mean i've I've, I've struggled to think of a better word than confusion really from local authorities not just local authorities also the police as well um in terms of what is allowed and what's not what's key what's essential what's not um and 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 like you said it does seem to be happening on an individual local authority level so it's just very very difficult for us to give blanket advice to people um to traders to customers to members um and yeah it's i don't think even half the time the local authorities know what is and isn't allowed well i think we we, it's it's an issue that we do need to address it's something that you brought up with me a couple of weeks ago and i was oh we've got bigger problems we've got bigger problems but actually now i think it's going to be a massive problem is actually convincing the public that what's going on is safe i think you have a lot of twitching curtains you have a lot of people uh phoning the police or other uh, local authorities if they see something they believe in um against the lockdown or is you know un you know, unhelpful in the, in this crisis and you can understand that that will happen so i think that even once i'm trading there will be phone calls to police phone calls to local authorities they might get visited by enforcement or or police officers or whoever it may be they just have to be prepared for it be very polite be very understanding and um and be methodical and just say no we are here we're providing a service and we're key workers and this is what we're doing and this is how we're keeping it safe uh, but obviously if they are having problems just to get on the an email or phone to us and we'll see what we can do but yeah it, it's, it's going to be no one no one really knows where we are no one really knows where we're going no one really knows how it's all going to pan out so and no one really knows how to react so uh, there's a lot of people trying to do their best and that will cause some confusion at times and a lot yeah. of decisions on the fly and that's going to lead to inconsistency so we just need to be understanding of it and, and work with with the government to to, to iron all that out Cheers, Mark. Um, Bob, just touching a point about a point that you uh, you mentioned you made earlier on in terms of um, in terms of the unknown science, in terms of uh, the the potential transmission risk of the disease via food. Um, from what I understand, as it stands at the moment, there's no scientific advice um, to to say. Well, there's a very there's not clear or concrete scientific advice in terms of. Um, yeah, the, the the virus living on um on on surfaces such as plastic metal etc well i've i've seen several different theories or interpretations anyway um but one point i would like to make which is with regards to uh, what our customers what our members generally do i still think that delivery of food compared to going to a supermarket where you're faced with all those same challenges of potentially that virus being on all of that plastic packaging throughout the whole store surely delivery of food um, despite the fact that the virus can live on potentially surfaces, is still one of the safest ways to to eat, right? Yeah, absolutely. The, the the science is still way out there, but we do know viruses live on surfaces. We've known that for forever as as the food safety industry. Um, the thing to do is just take every possible precaution. There is definitely very, or the governments are saying there is very low risk on on packaging still. And if, if the customers in any doubt what their advice is as they receive a, a takeaway a food parcel is to dis- dispense it into something you know is safe in your own home and then to go and wash your hands. And then it is as safe as it can be. There is no evidence at all scientifically that it can transfer on, on the food itself, which is the yeah. good news. Yeah. Um, yeah. So it's only the packaging. So if you want to be 100 percent safe, just get it delivered take it straight out of the package, put it into your own hardware plate or whatever it might be, and go wash your hands and dispose of the the, the, the containers safely. Um, wash them out first and then put them in your recycling. And that's, the, you know, you, 
it's as good as you can do. And the chances of getting an infection from that are very, very, very low indeed. Thanks, Bob. Um, one of the, some key points uh, in, in that as well, that if you are thinking about doing that or you are thinking about going out and trading in whatever capacity that may be, um, I, you know, I mean, you know, for instance, delivery, um, there are a couple of things that you really must do. Um, you must speak to your insurance broker uh, and make sure that your liability insurance covers you for deliveries. I can pretty much hedge a bet that for most of you out there at the moment, it won't. So you need to to ensure that you let your delivery uh, sorry let your insurance broker know about that whoever it is that's insuring you speak to them about that because you have to be uh you have to add, get that as an addition to your policy also a real real key thing as well guys um if you're planning to do any deliveries yourself definitely definitely check with the provider of whatever the, the provider of your car or van insurance i know a lot of guys out there are using their um, their resident you know their normal uh, vehicle so their regular car to go out and do deliveries right now I know for a fact that with most insurance policies, um, domestic insurance policies that, you know, your car will be covered under, it will not cover you um, to do uh, commercial activity. So you must, must, must check with the car insurance provider and or potentially look at alternatives. It's really, really, really important um, that you do that because the last thing you want to be doing is out trading, you know, an incident occur and you not be covered for it. Um, you know, when it comes to the local authorities and informing them and this that and the other um that's a whole new ball game that i think we'll save for um for a future episode because we really could talk for an hour on on that subject alone um we've kind of run over here so i'm thinking i'm gonna have to sort of bring it to a bit of an end we um we wanted to sort of uh, sort of finish around half three for the uh, for the intro one um just want to say hopefully everyone has been onto the um the ncas corona info page uh, the, so the resource area, which is ncast.org.uk forward slash coronavirus. Um, you can find everything, everything that we've done so far um, in, in all of this at NCAST, you will find there. There's loads of useful tools, resources, articles, etc. Um, to not only provide you with all, hopefully all the information, the clarity you need, uh, but also try and provide information and support and practical ideas and tips on what, what it is you can be doing right now um, for those that want to or for those that really need to. Um, and we're going to be focusing a lot more on all of these other topics in the future episodes. Um, please, if you haven't already as well, fill out the latest survey that we did. Um, we have submitted that information to government already, but the more people that fill that in, the stronger that data is and the stronger, um, the more likely it is uh, that they'll listen. Um, we have had a few emails, actually. Um, I should, just wanted to quickly read, read out, which came in over the weekend. Um, apologies to anyone that emailed this morning um, or just before. I haven't uh, had a chance to answer those yet, um, but we will do. And I promise that any questions that come in in between now and then, we'll do our, uh, between now and the next episode, we'll do our absolute best to try and squeeze them all in. Uh, but this was somebody, uh, this was the Norfolk Duck Truck, um, and he says, I'm an NCAS member. Um, through my uh, company, the Norfolk Duck Truck, because I'm a limited company and pay corporation tax rather than PAYE, I'm excluded from both the support packages offered to the self-employed and furloughed staff. I suspect many members fall into this hole and are therefore receiving no government support. So please remind members to sign the petition asking the government to include us in the support packages. And hopefully you can all see the link at the bottom there. So that's petition.parliament uk forward slash petitions forward slash three one zero five one five um second uh, question that we had in that wasn't really a question so but the second question we had in uh, can i ask about the fact that we can't access any grants uh because we have no permanent premises that's from john um john i'm really really sorry buddy many members like you as it stands are not entitled to any form of grants um we are still really really fighting for that and calling for that um, Mark talked about what he's doing in particular earlier on um, and in the finance episode that we're going to be doing, if not the next one, then the one after that, um, we'll be looking at the issue of grants more closely. Um, we're going to have an accountant on there with us as well um, and also Mark talking about uh, what he's been doing in order to try and get that, uh, get that point across and shout as loudly as we can. And then third and finally, a lot of us are able to claim the grant of up to two and a half thousand pounds per month based on net pay. This will be issued in June and dated back to March. What will happen after that? As I can see that most for most of us, the season is already gone. And that is from Charles. Um, I'm not quite sure whether or not Charles was referring to the employee retention scheme or the self-employed measures there, um, as they're both rated at 80 percent up to two and a half thousand. Um, but the honest answer right now is, Charles, we simply don't know, I'm afraid, buddy, um, as we just don't know how long the lockdown measures are going to be in place. And ultimately, 
um, what impact that is going to have down the line on our industry. Um, you know, our priority with our conversations uh, with government right now has been to try and secure support for those that have still slipped the net. So we're just still fully focused on those that have got well, basically zilch other than um, if they fancy uh, sort of access access in universal credit, which, as we all know, is just simply not good enough for many people out there. Um, so as time goes on, as we draw closer to uh, as we draw closer to June, uh, we will raise that question for you on your behalf, Charles. Um, and it may well be that we see that support extended beyond June. But right now, our real, real focus has been on making sure that those that have slipped the net uh, get heard. Um, Mark, have you got any sort of further thoughts on this before uh, before we sort of sign off? Yeah, I mean, I'd, I'd say don't give up hope in terms of the grants. There's still something we're absolutely working on. There are, it's not just our sector, it's pretty much micro and SME businesses in the UK are really struggling at the moment. And there's a lot of information going into government about what kind of state these businesses are in because of uh, the crisis. So I think that I'd be very surprised if there aren't more support measures offered by the government at some point. I can't tell you what there will be or, or when or how. I think there will be. Um, you know, we're chatting on a weekly basis to them, direct into into the Department of Business, letting letting them know all of these problems as they come to us. So, um, yeah, I'm I'm very hopeful that we'll get some positive results for our members there. In terms of how long the support will last, I'd say it will last um, certainly until the the lockdown ends. Uh, but there's a people are already in discussions about how the lockdown ends and how we bring the economy back. Uh, up to boil essentially after you know three months of or longer of you know just stagnation so there will be support yeah we're, we're all as a country gonna have to pay for this money that's being spent now at some point in the future somehow but um i don't think it'll do anyone any favors to just to to turn the tap off halfway through because you know that they're, they're looking to save the economy all of these uh governments in you know in europe are looking to save uh, their, their economies because it's you know it'll be a far less damaging crash if if the businesses are you know are still fluid have, you know, have got cash in them um this all ends um so yeah i i can understand why people, you know what happens when this bit runs out i think that in the same way that we'll probably find out today that we're going to be staying inside for another three or four weeks it will be a when you need to know type thing and they'll 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 work it out as, as they go and so, but they, they won't leave people um, with nothing um, because they've extended things and, and stopped people from trading further. They won't just say, oh, you've had your thing, so now you start. You know, there, there is support there. The government are trying to help us. NCAS are doing everything they can to help every single one of our customers. So I'd say you know, keep the faith, you know, stay strong, stick in there, and we will, we'll all get through this together. Thanks, Mark. That's really, really positive. Um, and just in line with that, um, so just before we go, we're planning the next webinar. As it stands, we're hoping to do the next one on Friday. Um, we will let you know tomorrow um, and, and confirm that. If it won't, if it's not Friday, it will be Monday next week. Um, but we are hoping to do another one on Friday. So hopefully at three o'clock Friday. Um, and just yeah, we're a hope we're aiming to try and take this in a more positive direction, really, and focus on exactly what it is that you can be doing as a business and also looking at what others out there are already doing um, to generate some form of income right now. Um, um, like I said at the beginning, we really just want to be holding these regularly to keep everyone up to date with the latest changes and guidance or advice, uh, legislation, um, as even still things are still changing on an hourly uh, well, daily basis, sometimes hourly basis, um, which has proved extremely challenging for all of us. Um, yeah, and on top of that, we really want to be bringing you good news stories, encouragement and support, um, and hopefully lots of feel-good stuff too. So um, we're going to end there for today. Um, as we wanted the introductory one to be fairly short and sweet, but there and there saying that, I'll uh, we've all banged on for 49 minutes. Um, I just want to say one more time uh, on behalf of um, not just myself and Bob and Mark, um, but from all of us at NCAS, really, for all of the support, guys, the support and uh, the love and appreciation that you've shown us over the last few weeks and four weeks. Um, it's just been absolutely overwhelming. Um, the team at NCAS have been working at a really, really reduced capacity. Uh, because obviously we've been hit pretty hard by this too, as as you can imagine, um, and so and we're also handling more inquiries and and dealing with you know with more um, yeah more inquiries than we ever have before. So it's been a really really busy busy time for all all of us. And 
Um, yeah, everyone's been working really, really hard. And I can honestly say, I know it's those warm comments and those thank yous that have gotten a lot of the staff through it and have played a massive part in keeping a lot of us going. So, uh, yeah, keeping us going through some very, very long days. So thank you so, so much. It really does mean the world to us. Um, yeah, I can't thank you enough, really. Okay, um, I think we'll wrap it up there. Uh, Bob, Mark, do you want to say goodbye? Yeah, goodbye, everyone. God bless. Keep safe. That's the main thing. Stay safe, everybody. Keep the faith. Okay. All right, so goodbye from the three of us. Um, and all being well, we'll see you at uh, Friday at, uh, at, three, at uh, 3 o'clock. So we'll, we'll catch you then. Take care, everyone. Cheers.